Jeremiah 17. Uh, my name is Sean. I have the honor of doing the main sermon today. Um, usually I send out via email the lesson just so people can easily follow along as well as go back and double check it themselves. So if you want to receive that, kind of notice the person to your left or to your right. They can forward that email to you just so you can kind of kind of get that uh, for yourself there. So we are going to be in Jeremiah 17 in the beginning. But my first question, have you guys ever done something one time and now it's become your reputation? Yeah. Yeah. You've done something once and now you've got a new nickname for yourself, a new thing that how people view you. Um, I'm originally from America, from Los Angeles. And I lived in Sydney for about five years previously to moving here just last January. My first day in Sydney, um, we were kind of walking around, we went around, if you guys have ever been in Sydney, there's like the, uh, the, the downtown area, and I forget what the building's called, QVB, yeah. Queen yeah. Victoria yeah. Building, yeah. and uh, me and a friend, we heard about this thing called Boost Juice, and we're like, we've got to find Boost Juice, but we had no idea where we were, so we went our very first afternoon trying to find this place, and I think we got lost for about an hour. And the whole entire time I've lived, and everyone who's known me since then has looked at me that I'm bad at directions. Yeah. I got lost one time. There's a difference between not knowing what the street name is to being bad at directions. Yeah. But, you know, all, all, my whole reputation now, everybody looks at me that I have bad directions. Who here else has bad directions? Okay, I'm not one of you, all right? But, <laughs> but you know, good news is, actually, is that we're not the only ones. Did you know that every single human being is bad at directions? No. Oh. Fun fact is that humans cannot walk straight. When lost in a desert or in a thick forest devoid of any major landmarks, people will always tend to walk in a circle. They don't know what they're doing. They'll always, and you can actually test this on your own. Get into a field you know where nothing's at, put a blindfold on, you're going to start walking in a circle. See, not, not only are they like this physically, but I believe humans get easily lost in a lot of areas in their life. Not only talking about lost in directions, but I think they also get lost in their lives as well. Not only in their life, but I believe that we can also get lost in our relationship with God. And this gives us quite a new understanding or an insight into the scripture we just read last week. Come on. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26, it says, Therefore I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. In Paul's letter to the Corinthian church here, he talks about in his run or in his relationship with God, he doesn't have kind of a path that has no aim. He is having an aim in his life. Come on. Because when you're running aimlessly, it doesn't matter how fast you are running or how hard you are running, you're going to completely keep getting lost in your life if you do not have an aim. Right. And we've been talking about being inspired, but I think the thing about being inspired is, have you ever done something that you suck at? Yeah. It's not very inspiring, right? Um, for my, I don't know how this happened, but my left hand can't turn more than this. Um, it can't go flat, so I have to actually like turn it this way. Um, but I've always wanted to play guitar, but I have to kind of play guitar like it's like a cello because wow. my hand can't actually turn. Um, so I stopped playing it because I suck at it. And it's one of those things that if we're trying to really go after a relationship with God, but we feel like we keep going in circles, people get, they, they, they get depressed and they're like, man, I'm not going in. Why, why, do, I, why do I keep running this race? Mm -hmm. So our main thing is we have to run to actually see progress in our life. And I think a big part of that is you need to find your landmark. Right. And that's going to be my lesson for this morning is finding your landmark. See, I love the Word of God because I believe it teaches us truths that we already know to be true. Most of the things we read here, actually we already know in our hearts that it's true. Sometimes they are revolutionary that we've never read it before, but other times they just need to be given authority. Have you ever told somebody something and been trying to teach them something in their life and they did not listen to you until, you know, your friend Billy Bob over here told them and now they want to follow your advice? You know, it's the same thing. The Bible needs to give these things we already know to be true. It needs to give it authority. Now God's saying it. What are you going to do about it? See, there are truths that we already know to be true. Uh, without love, you are nothing. We don't need the Bible to tell us that, but it gives us authority. Do what is right and you will be happy. 
Wives want a husband that are kind and compassionate. You don't need a Bible to tell you that. The wives will tell you that plenty. These truths don't have many opposers to them. No many, not many people will say, no, that's not true. Um, but again, they just need someone to say with authority. The next truth we're going to be looking at is, is quite tricky, though, because we know it's true, but most of our life we're going to be fighting it. We don't like this truth. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond pure. Who can understand it? Point number one is where you at. See, most of us don't like this truth. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond pure. And I think Many times throughout the scriptures, we struggle with scriptures like this that have such a strong claim. Think about scriptures that talk about Matthew 7, 7 through 8, or I believe about 13 through 14. Most people are going to be going to hell. That's a hard truth right there. It talks about in 1 Timothy 6, 10, the, the love of money is the root of all evil. We ask all evil? Right? It's a strong claim. The greatest commandments are to love God and love people. Like, is that the, really the strongest commandment right there, to love God more than my family? Yeah. Because of these strong claims, we struggle with that. Thing. So we hear this one, that the heart is deceitful above everything else. And we ask ourselves, really? Above everything? More deceitful than, than the politicians who just want to say whatever they can say to get elected? More deceitful than that? More deceitful than that African prince who called me the other day and said they need five hundred dollars because their, you know, their account is blocked. More deceitful than that person? We, we don't, we don't think so. More deceitful than cheaters, scammers, thieves, ex-boyfriends, catfishers, you know, uh, Facebook profiles. Like, uh, is the heart really deceitful above all those things? And if the Bible claims it is, see your heart. The thing that the Disney movies have told you to follow is the king of deceit. I believe that happiness at all costs is the motto of your heart. Excuse me, the, the um, mo motto. There we go. <laughs> My heart deceived me right there. Uh, because I believe that our heart, all it really wants to do is make us feel happy. And so it will tell us any lie to get us to feel that way. They'll say, you can follow this, you can follow that, go after that desire, it'll make you happy. And it, and it deceives us into not following God or not following the right thing that we know we should do. It will tell you anything you want as long as it's going to make you happy. See, the Bible tells us this truth and actually prepares us to battle this. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, it says, So, you think you are standing firm? Be careful that you don't fall. It's talking about, hey, your heart's going to deceive you, thinking like, hey, I'm strong in the Lord right here. I'm good. My faith is great. It's like, those are the people you need to double check. Are you really standing firm? It is usually when you think you're flying the highest is when you get knocked down. You know, there's, there's this uh, article I was reading in the last couple of weeks. It was talking about the most common excuse, excuses cheaters give their partners. So from a, a woman to a man... The top three excuses when they're going to cheat, what do they say they're doing? The third one is they're saying they're staying late at work. The second one is they're out, uh, they're having a night out with the girls. And the third one, uh, the number one thing is they're going to the gym. For men to women, it's third one is staying late for work. Second one is playing golf. And the first one is watching football or footy. So, you know, be on the lookout. But... <laughs> What, what, what got me thinking is like some of these like, oh, hey, I would have thought that, I wouldn't have thought that. But it got me thinking, I was wondering, what are the top lies our heart tells us when it comes to our love with God? What are the top lies we tell ourselves when we say we're in love with God? Whoa. I think about sometimes it's, well, I'm doing a lot for God. I read my Bible, I pray, I go to church. That means I must love God. Well, I, I have always loved God, so I always will. For me, I grew up in a Christian family, going to church maybe about once a month or whatever. And so I would always say, of course I love God. I've just grown up that way. But did I really love Him? I don't know. 
You know, you feel loved by God, so he must feel loved by you. Wow. Well, if God's answering my prayers and he loves me, maybe he feels loved by me. No, that just means God has unconditional love. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you have a great relationship. Yeah. Two different things. See, doing good things for God and loving God are, are completely different. Sometimes we are caught up in doing things rather than just loving God. Mm -hmm. In the same way, if you went to a marriage counselor and you explained your love uh, to, towards the counselor about your, your spouse there by just listing off things that you do, that, that wouldn't be right, right? You'd be like, well, hey, I take out the trash, I clean the car, I do this. I love them. Like, well... They, the, the, per, the thing is, is they, they don't feel loved by you. Right. It doesn't matter all those things that you are doing. Mm -hmm. See, we cannot be caught up in just doing things for God without just going back, how is your love for God? Right. And it's a bit confusing sometimes because we know that also I can't go to the marriage counselor and not be cleaning the car, not taking out the trash, <laughs> and my wife feel loved, right? i got, I got to be doing both there. It's the same way with God. But we, we have to understand the deeper meaning of these things. Do not get caught up in praying and lose sight of talking to God. Come on, Sean. There's a big difference. You can, I, I know I did that prayer every time I, I went to sleep at night. Lord, I lay myself down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. doesn't mean I was talking to God. Yeah. I, I prayed before I ate. does not mean I was talking to God. Right. Don't get lost in talking to others about Jesus and forget to love the lost. Mm. Two different things. Inviting someone to church is not the same thing as making a disciple. True. Not the same thing. And we can get mixed up because we're doing things, but we're not doing the things that God actually feels loved by. Yes, obedience is God's love language. Does, I'm not saying stop doing these things. But His commandment is to love Him with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind. You can't say, I'm obeying God, but not follow his number one commandment, which is love him with all your heart. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make sense. And see, we can hide behind our religious activities because we're afraid to actually admit where our heart truly is. Yeah. And the thing is, we can run from God, but you cannot hide. Yeah. Hebrews 12, excuse me, Hebrews 14, 12, excuse me, Hebrews 4, 12 through 13, it says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You know, it says here that, that God's word and God's sword here can even penetrate and divide Soul and spirit. And I usually ask people, hey, what's the difference between soul and spirit? Hmm. I don't even know, to be honest. But God's word is so accurate and so precise, it can even divide what we think is undivisible. It's like, wow, you can even divide that? Like, that's how accurate and precise God's word is here. And it tells us the truth that we already know again. That God knows everything. Yeah. And that your heart is laid before him like an inventory of feelings and attitudes. And you can just see it all right there. And it talks about, well, if we really want to have a relationship with God, and you want to enter to the, and you want to enter the light here, those things that you are hiding in the darkness, they will need to be exposed. The things of where am I truly at in my heart? And God is an expert at exposing the heart. An expert. For most of us, though, this is probably our biggest fear. Talking about the things that we've never told anybody. Or actually saying what's going on. Not only talking about the things that we've done, but to say out loud the things that we're thinking, how we feel. Most of us are really untrained in this. I know that was me most of my life. I, I never talked about my feelings. I thought it was unmanly to cry. I thought that's not what men do. And for most of my life, I just lock and keep not talking about it. But God has a way of exposing it. Mm -hmm. See, the sooner that we actually face these fears, the sooner that we accept this, the more time we have to transform. Good the sooner that we just get over this fear and say, hey, let me face where my heart really is, then you actually get to change. Yeah, yeah you may feel good that nobody knows or anything, but you don't actually 
can change your life. See, we need to actually pray and look forward to that the nastiest things in our hearts get exposed and that we can change. There are a couple ways that if we don't do this, there's a couple ways that God's going to expose it. There's a couple ways God's going to expose our heart here. I think the first one is through the Bible, through the Word. It says here that, the, again, the Bible is like a sword. It's alive and active. It's actually going after. It has, an, it, has, it has a life. It's going after something. And it's here to cut your heart and expose the pus that's been rotting inside. And like any of us would know, right, if we were going to have surgery, surgery is going to hurt, yeah. right? But at the same time, surgery is going to save us. But the thing is, is I want to ask you, let's say that you had cancer, 100%, you needed uh, surgery to, to remove it. But you go to one hospital that's the closest to you, and they come and you say, okay, yeah, you need to get it cut out. But the only thing is, is we don't have any painkillers here. Do, do you still want the surgery? Most of us would be like, okay, peace, I'm going to the one three, three streets down, right? I'm not, I'm not staying here. And that's kind of what we do with the Bible. We realize, okay, hey, I, I know that this, this word is here to save me, it's here to help me, it's going to be painful. But then it says, it's going to be really painful. It's, it's going to hurt a lot, actually. And there's no way of getting around it. And then we say, all right, bye, I'm just going to go to something else then. I'm going to, I'm going to go take aspirin over here, I'm going to take something else. You know, you take your little home remedies. And it doesn't work. And that's the thing that people run away from is, yes, the Bible's going to expose your heart. It's also going to be painful, but at the same time, it's going to save your life. Yes, come on, Sean. See, this pain is not intended to cause hurt, but healing. Mm -hmm. Most people try to heal by, them only, uh, by dealing with only the actions, but it is in the heart where sin originates. In Matthew 15, 19, it says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, Adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. Talks about if you're only doing, hey, I only need to talk about after I did it. I only thought about it. You're losing the battle already. It has to get deep in your heart first. You have to actually attack it at your heart before you actually put it in action. And that's the thing is most people just stop with, with oh, well, I'm only thinking it. I'm only feeling it. No, you have to dig down in your heart. The first way is God's going to expose your heart by the Bible. The second way is through challenges. See, challenges in our life, I believe, are God-given situations. Whether He allows it or wills it into your life. They can be many different challenges. There's financial challenges, educational, relationships, careers, debts, and many other things that just enter our lives. But God exposes our hearts also by people and other relationships. Either they've sinned against you and hurt you in one way or another, or they're calling you to change and doing something good for you, but it, it still kind of hurts right there. Mm -hmm. Now, how you respond to the challenge, though, that's, that's up to you. Yeah. How you respond, that's, that's your response, and you have to take responsibility for it. I remember hearing this story about if you're holding a cup of coffee, when someone comes along and bumps into you, and it shakes your arm and makes you spill the coffee, why did you spill coffee? Most people will say, well, it's because someone bumped into me. Well, that's the wrong answer, actually. You spilled coffee because there was coffee in your cup. Mm -hmm. Yes, you spilled because someone hit you. Okay, something came out. But you spilled coffee because there was coffee in your cup. If you had tea in your cup, you would have spilled tea. If you had water in your cup, you would have spilled water. But you spilled coffee because that's what's in your cup. In the same way, when challenges happen in your life, what comes out was already there. Wow. Come on. It's not about, oh, the person bumped me, so that's why it came out. No, it, it's in there. When they bumped you, it was, just, it was just exposing what's already in your heart. Gotcha. And see, that's what God's trying to do here. He's trying to put challenges in your life to show you what's in your heart. Mm -hmm. Spilling is always going to happen in life because always, we're always getting bumped by somebody or something. But what spills out of your heart is based on what you store in your heart. Therefore, when life comes and shakes you up, which is bound to happen, it is easy to fake what's in your heart until you get a little bit rattled right there. So you have to ask yourself, what is in your cup? When life gets tough, what spills over? Is it joy? 
gratitude, peace, humility, or is it anger, bitterness, harsh words? And we can blame whatever we want to blame. I was hungry. I was tired. My, my, my people at my work aren't nice. Whatever it may be, it's, it's what is in your heart. What are they exposing in your heart? Wow. See, in the first bit of finding our landscape, or excuse me, our, our landmark, is we have to first know, wh where are you at? Mm. Where are you first? You can put in the directions, you can put in the address and GPS, but you first have to find out your location. Mm -hmm. I want everyone today, my first challenge is on a scale from 1 to 10, even those that are in the church and in the membership, on a scale from 1 to 10, where are you at in seeking God with all your heart? Mm -hmm. This is a good question, not just to ask somebody else, but to ask yourself. Yeah. And talk to somebody about where you think you are and how you can get help in this area. Point number two now is finding your landmark. So we talked about, hey, God and life itself is going to expose what's in your heart. Let's see what's in Jesus' cup right here Come on. when it spills over. In Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he would be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, man shall, not, man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him to a high place and showed him an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. We read the different struggles that Jesus actually had to go through here. First, we see hunger, thirst, loneliness out there in the wilderness, and then Satan. This is all the things that Jesus was going through. And we read even in the beginning one, hunger alone is enough for most of us to spill a little bit of something out of our cup right here, right? We get hungry, things are coming out of the cup. <laughs> uh, maybe a flood, I don't know. But, but we, we see here that... There's a couple different things we have to actually understand. One is two things, two different things are happening in Jesus. One, that there is the testing, and then there's the tempting. Two different things. That Jesus is tested by the Holy Spirit, and then he's tempted by Satan. And sometimes people have that question. I used to ask myself that as well. What's the difference between God testing you and Satan tempting you? Come on. Right? And we read throughout this, and sometimes we think hunger is a temptation from Satan. No, it's not. It's a testing from the Lord. Wow. Very different. You know, we think, oh, going out into the wilderness is a temptation from Satan. No, it's, it's a testing from the Lord. Hmm. And kind of how you distinguish these things is like all tests, they are to exposing in your heart and make you better before you enter reality. Most of us in university, we freak out about tests. We're, we're studying for them, we're trying to get better, but that's actually not the real test. That's just in a, in a classroom, on a piece of paper. This is to help you when you get out into your job later on. Mm. Right? And that's what God does. He helps test your heart so that when you get tempted by Satan, you're actually going to overcome. Mm. All testing from God is to strengthen you. All temptations from Satan is to weaken you. Wow. Come on. That, that, that's all it is, that God and Satan have a different motive in their heart. But we see here that in this time, it would have been one of Jesus' weakest moments in his life. Hungry, thirsty, alone, and being tempted by Satan. Yet what came out of him? It was not doubt. There was no bitterness. What came out of him was scriptures, was faith, was a trust of a son to a father. And the biggest challenge, actually, in the wilderness is not not having food or water. It's being lost in direction. 
You're there and you're trapped and you don't know how to get out. So you panic. You freak out when people are lost. And they don't know what they're doing. See, God actually has a special fondness for wildernesses. It's kind of funny. If you read throughout the Bible, he's always sending somebody into the wilderness. You know? Uh, you have John the Baptist. How he started his ministry was in the wilderness. He sends um, Jesus out here in the wilderness. God is the same God uh, that sent Jesus to the wilderness as well as the Israelites with, with uh, Moses. He loves just sending people in the middle of nowhere where all you hear is wind. Just, there's something about that that God loves to do. But I think it's, it's, it's right because we see around that life is a journey in the wilderness. That there are many bushes and trees we can head to, but there's only one landmark that will actually lead us out and not be lost anymore. And God is that only landmark. See, walking towards the direction of God is the very reason why Jesus was never lost. All these other things that he could have walked towards, the temple, the other religious people, even Satan saying, hey, I'll give you all the, everything in the world. He didn't walk towards anything. The only reason he didn't get lost is because he kept walking towards God. See, I believe we're all made to worship, regardless if you're atheist, Buddhist, Hindu, or whatever you are coming to church today. We are all made to worship. And either we're going to worship God or we're going to worship something else in our life. And you're going to decide that. So you're either worshiping the true God, or I believe you're a turtle or a mosquito. <laughs> you're either worshiping God or you're a mosquito. Have you ever had a mosquito in your room, and you turn off the lights and turn on the hall light, and they just kind of drift off into the other light? Yeah. Right? That's most people. They're in one place. They're just following different lights. They don't actually know where they're going. They're just following different lights. Or you're a turtle, where the, the light pollution has actually made you think you're following the right light. There's a lot of turtles that have died because there's cities where they have high light pollution and turtles actually follow the stars and the moons to actually get them around and navigate. And so they follow the city and they end up dying because they get hit by a boat or they go to the wrong shore or they're planting their eggs in the wrong place. And so light pollution has actually hurt the turtle population. I believe that's the same thing for us spiritually. We think, ah, I'm going towards God, but it's totally not God. I'm going towards God, but it's just you're going to that church because your family's been going to that church. You don't actually really connect to it. Come on, Sean. You don't actually have a real relationship with God. You're just going because that's just tradition. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we deceive ourselves. We tell ourselves that's God, but, but it's actually not. See, these landmarks make us feel like we're not lost, but we never end up where we want to go. Yeah. And you have a choice before you. Either you're going to worship God, or you're going to find something else to worship. In Romans 1.25, it talks about this choice. It says, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worship and serve created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. My last challenge for you guys this morning is, who are you worshiping today? Are you worshiping created things or the Creator? And the main thing is, what is your landmark? Are you walking in the direction of God and not turning back? In Luke 9, verse 62, it says, Jesus replied, No one who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service of the kingdom of God. That your landmark is not just, I want a better life. Or your landmark is not just chasing feelings of happiness in vain. But it must be God. That is your only landmark that's ever going to lead you out of your wilderness. Come on. See, in conclusion, guys, as we live, we all know this, we grow old. But life is a progress of earning everything so that you can start losing everything. Your job, you'll soon retire. Our youth, it'll fade away from our knees up. Your children, they'll leave your home and form new families of their own. Health, it will soon be lost. Spouse, they will not last forever. See, why do sailor, sailors and people that are sailing, why do they follow stars rather than planes? Well, stars stay in one place while planes keep moving everywhere. Okay. In the same way, people have landmarks for things that are not going to be in their life forever. Your beauty, your career, your family, they're not always going to be there. 
you need to get a landmark that is situated in fur. Come on, yeah. I want to encourage everyone, make your landmark today. God, thank you very much. Come on. Woo!